Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nisa Floyd. I am the program coordinator at Atlanta Contemporary. We are a free admission museum in Atlanta where we are focusing on changing the way we all see art through creating conversations like today's conversation, our exhibitions, our programs, and et cetera. So if you are able to donate to Atlanta Contemporary to help us continue this work, please do so. And I will ask Emma, my coworker, to drop that donation button in the chat. Today's conversation is a part of our Art as a Solution partnership with Urban Catalyst Lab, where we work on unpacking the future of arts in the presence of interdisciplinary groups. In more detail, today's conversation will explore climate justice activists, artists, researchers, and the ways in which we navigate figuring out how to use art as a participant Tory element in resolving the issue of climate injustice and figuring out how to work on urban hybridizations as a solution. With that being said, I will pass the Zoom baton to Rexanda so that she can begin our conversation. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and hello to the, our distinguished panel as well. Uh, we're here today, as Nisa mentioned, uh, not only to continue our series of Art as a Solution panels, but also thanks to our partnership with UN Habitat and other uh, global entities like Major Group for Children and Youth uh, to be part of the United Nations ECOSOC Youth uh, Forum. Um, and the topic of today, as Nisa has alluded briefly, is climate justice. And particularly, we'll be speaking about climate justice through the lenses of local, regional, and global perspectives. Uh, we will be focusing primarily on the hybrid solutions at the intersection of art and technology, or vertical gardens, or food forest, or um, simply uh, water sanitation uh, installations by, by young people around the world, and so on. The reason why the topic of today is climate justice is not only because it intersects all the sustainable development goals that are under the revision at United Nations this year, but also because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, sure, COVID-19 pandemic has put um, an emphasis on the public health, but it so did also on the climate justice, simply because climate justice, it is intersected with social justice, with health justice, and um, it is interconnected with all the social justice issues. If in the past the activists, the nonprofit uh, communities uh, were rallying on the street to help the people understand the connection between the urban inequalities and the climate change, well now due to COVID, this is very clear. From the US to India, to from Kenya to Philippines, the most marginalized groups were the ones that were the most impacted by climate change, by public health and so on. For example, I live in Atlanta, and as an Atlantan, unfortunately, we know that 50% of our population is African American, and, and it is also systemically the one that is usually on, under the poverty line. And climate change and climate, it's only um, straining that uh, perspective. So if we speak about 2020, more than 22 environmental uh, disasters happened in the United States alone. And that, again, impacted the vulnerable groups, whether we speak the, about the coastal side on the state of Georgia, where the Black communities were the hardest hit by the floods. Um, well, now let's speak a bit about, from a global perspective, with a shift from the US to Asia Pacific. Uh, this, the climate change is still a very big problem there, too. The UN Framework Convention on uh, um, climate change noted that Asia's populations boom, the frequency of natural disasters, the urbanization trends are the ones that make the region especially vulnerable to climate change. And of course, you might say that the climate justice narrative is a bit different and definitely from region to region, from location to location, climate justice narrative and context is different. And we hope that the panel today will help you learn more about that. However, there is one thing that is globally true Unfortunately, the victims that are the most vulnerable to climate change are the vulnerable groups. And yes, we're speaking about the young people, we're speaking about the people with disabilities, but we're also speaking about all the inhabitants of the developing countries. 
that um, more, more often um, are uh, producing fewer emissions per capita than any other countries. So without further ado, uh, this conversation uh, that we're bringing in today is very much a hybrid conversation like the solutions themselves. Uh, we have experts uh, uh, that will be speaking about the intersection between art and technology, particularly when it comes to changing behaviors on climate justice or raising awareness on climate justice. We'll hear from Freya Murai from Google Art and Culture about how they have created hybrid approaches where scientists, artists, and technologists work together in helping uh, promote uh, the uh, climate change awareness globally. We'll hear from uh, the artist Hanif Qureshin from India, where um, the artists there on that side of the world are working with community in the solar energy, um, as well as art to create more community engagement on these topics and change behaviors. We'll hear from the US artist, uh, uh, Jessica Anderson, about how technology and art, as well as uh, environmental science can come together uh, to help people connect better between the natural habitats uh, and, um, and um, the environment as well. And we will also hear on the other perspective of uh, the topic of the climate justice about the community engagement from UN Habitat, we'll hear particularly about how the youth from Somalia, from Kenya, from Ecuador have installed hand washing stations, digital mapping tools and murals all around those regions during the COVID times. We'll also hear from Atlanta Mayor's office where uh, the reuse of construction materials in the effort to reduce the landfill waste uh, have been not only utilized to decrease the CO2 emissions, but also to create a new sustainable construction ecosystem and create more jobs. And lastly, we'll hear from Regine uh, from the Committee for Asian Youth Cooperation about the SDGs villages, where again, uh, hybrid solutions like the vertical gardens were utilized to create a new ecosystem. So uh, before we jump into uh, the uh, speak our speakers um, as uh, directly today, um, we'll just uh, very quickly run you through the run of show. The very first 30 minutes will be very much dedicated to the use cases positioned by our distinguished guests today. Uh, they'll have five minutes um, where they'll be positioning their point of view on climate justice. And then we'll be running into a moderated conversation. And lastly, on the Q&A. And as Nisa has mentioned, we encourage all of you to participate in the chat. We'll make sure that we integrate the questions into the conversation and we have your voice heard. So um, here it is. We're starting with our first panel to, uh, panelist today, Freya Murai from uh, Google Art and Culture. Freya? Hello. And um, thank you, Roxanda, and thanks, um, Nisa, as well, for having me here today. Um, so to just very briefly introduce myself, um, so my area of work is um, at the intersection of culture, technology, and storytelling. Um, I'm really interested in the ever-evolving relationship between art and technology and how um, issues around kind of, um, yeah, the issues our climate faces, can be explored and communicated through these two lenses. I'm part of a team, as Roxander said, called Google Arts and Culture. And since 2011, we've been working with over 2,000 cultural institutions in over 80 countries and artists around the world. And um, the overall kind of mission of the team is to preserve and bring the world's art and culture online, making it available to anyone anywhere. And we're a non-profit initiative within Google and I head up our um, artist collaborations and um, our sustainability work at the Google Arts and Culture Lab, where we bring arts and tech communities together to explore and experiment creative applications of cutting edge technologies. And um, so if we just so to look at in terms of thinking when I think of kind of um, scientific climate data. So, you know, I as an average person like me, um, when we're faced with raw scientific data, it can sometimes be overwhelming and hard to digest. And climate data often conjures up, particularly for me anyway, images of graphs and charts. And now art has always been a medium to convey complex subjects and address challenges we face. And artists can help us see climate through a new lens. And the role artists have and continue to play in connecting us with our environment, 
highlighting and engaging us with climate issues is not new, but it is ever urgent. And as part of um, the, the, some of the programme that we have is a very, very um, small um, programme in the grand scheme of things, but it's as part of our artist residency programme, we supported and continue to support a series of experimental web-based artworks that offer a new lens with which to explore climate data. It's titled Heartbeat of the Earth, and we launched it last year with the UNFCCC on World Environment Day. And um, it began with five artists who took key findings from the landmark 2019 IPCC report and data from other scientific institutions, such as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the World Meteorological Organization to create four interactive pieces of art about climate. They address topics from, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see uh, um, melting glaciers, this is a piece by Fabian Offner to um, on the next slide, um, rising um, sea levels and this used Google Street View and Google um, Earth Technologies to map these. Um, and I think there's going to be a link in the chat. So if you want to go and explore any of these artworks, um, you can do that direct. And now just two I'm going to briefly focus on today are two artworks. One on the next um, slide is Acidifying Oceans by um, Christina Tarkini. Now, um, Christina worked with a scientist called Frederic Gazot, and she invites you to dive into the ocean and explore the impact of rising temperatures and in turn CO2 levels on marine life over time. Um, so from um, pre-industrial revolution to 2100, um, you can explore devastating effects CO2 levels are having on ocean animals and species corals bleaching, fish disappearing, jellyfish booming, and a new breed of sea creature, the Anthropocene animal that starts to populate our oceans. So this is a, a data storytelling um, experiment, an artwork that uses point cloud, um, and that's the visualization you can see that was used to visualize the data and to show the change happening both on water molecules acidifying and the animal particles reacting and it takes you through this journey, as you can see a brief clip of there. But if you want to click on the link shared, you can um, experience the artwork in full. And then um, a second artwork is um, on the next slide <clears throat> is called What We Eat by Laurie Frick. Um, and, you know, I found this quite interesting in terms of like 25% of global emissions is due to food production more than transportation. It wasn't something I was aware of before. And um, what artist Laurie Frick has done with this artwork is inviting you to engage with the CO2 footprint for individual foods and diets. And she uses hand-drawn um, illustrations that are then mapped into this interactive experiment that explores the impact of individual diets and um, it's based on, because the data that was available from US, UK and France only, and what she wanted to do is expose the disparity of CO2 consumption between foods. And you can, in fact, explore CO2 data for your own daily diet. So you can interact with it and put in what you've eaten and learn how you could reduce your carbon footprint. So these are just two examples of um, Art Week artworks as um, part of the um, programme that we've been working on. And I think maybe just to... Um, just to end, um, one thing that, um, you know, if we kind of come out um, and look at it on kind of on um, in term around the role of um, culture and art and technology and the importance of kind of these um, collaborations and communication between science, art, whether it's economics, politics, etc. Um, I think Yo-Yo Ma, who is the renowned cellist and UN messenger for peace, speaks about so brilliantly as he talks about the power of culture to turn the other into us, connecting our most personal truths to the largest planetary goals. And so I just thought I'd end um, there with that quote. Thank you. Doug will take us to a different side of the planet now, <laughs> right? To Kenya, Somalia and Ecuador. Um, and will integrate us into some of the uh, projects that he has run this year. So, Doug, why don't you mind introducing yourself very shortly and, and walking us through your use case? 
Thank you, Roxanda. Um, really honored to be here. I think this is a really important and critical issue um, to address. I, as on the screen, I'm a program management officer for uh, Human Rights Social Inclusion Unit. My, my um, expertise is children and youth. I've been with UN Habitat for about a decade, but previous to that, I did work with young people in the nonprofit world for about 15 years or so. So yeah, really, really excited to be here. I mean, what the angle when Roxanda asked me, what should, what should we talk about climate change? My first thing was that we need to talk about climate justice. Um, this comes from two sides. One side in working with um, uh, marginalized groups in Canada. I worked, I don't know if anyone knows Canada. Um, I worked in Vancouver, the downtown east side, which is considered to be the poorest postal code in Canada. We did a lot, I did a lot of work with um, Indigenous youth, street youth, sex trade workers, and so on. Um, and what always struck me, especially when you're talking about the urban environment, is that equity is critical. That you can make a beautiful urban environment, make wonderful parks like Vancouver has, with Stanley Park, one of the largest urban parks in the world, yet right next to it, you can have, uh, again, if you know Vancouver, the downtown east side of Vancouver, which is desolately poor. And if you even ask the young people from that, the, the poor area, if they go to this other area, they say no. And the barriers are not just, uh, they're not uh, just economic, they're social and there's many things. So we must talk about that. And now that I'm living in the global south and working in Kenya, it's even more pronounced um, where, you know, people here living on less than five dollars a day. So this uh, the first slide. And so I'll just quickly use the slides as kind of backdrop. But this first slide um, is um, Chie Bastida. She's um, Otomi people. Uh, from Mexico. Um, I was just on a panel with her an hour and a half ago talking on climate justice and climate issues. But I mean, she was, she, um, I've actually known her since she's been a baby, actually, from through her father, who's an Indigenous activist in Mexico. And I mean, they, they, the fight they had to fight is a small community outside Mexico City um, with massive encroaching industry of which they had absolutely no power, uh, massive pollution of which they couldn't have any control. I mean, one of the stories from the, her community was that it used to be called, it was it's called Tultepec, T-U-L-T-E-P-E-C, which means people of the Tule or people of the reeds. They used to weave the reeds from the water and the lakes there. When we came there on a youth program, um, basically there was almost no lake left. It was complete sewage. Um, when the wind shifted, and because it was an inland lake, when the wind shifted, um, or industry had come in because it was a huge aquifer that fed into Mexico City. And when the wind shifted, the kids on the, in the schools had to hit go on the ground or they'd pass out. Um, and that's again, the issues of environment and abuse and, and that and the climate change issues for, for them now in which the rains have stopped and the, the, their water sources are drying up. So I think um, that, and this is Chie when she's at this, um, one of the big uh, climate change rallies pre-COVID uh, and the work she's doing again with indigenous peoples and so on. So I think it's, that's incredible, um, really important that we, we recognize that the racism, the Me Too, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff has direct and complete linkages to this climate issue. We cannot leave everybody, anyone behind in this. And there's many reasons we are. This is Leah Namugerwa. Leah is a, another climate change activist who I was also in a panel with two hours ago. Um, Leah is Amazing, this amazing young woman from Uganda. And it, what's fascinating with her, her and the many young people that, um, that are kind of followers of Greta Thunberg. And I've heard the many criticisms of Greta that she's, uh, you know, she's from Sweden and she's, you know, elite and so on and so on. And there are some, some reality that, uh, you know, the Northerners talking about how to save the world is sometimes a bit of a, uh, wrong sometimes but what's happened is that her message has been picked up across Africa and most a lot of the developing world and it's young women that are picking it up and so specifically Leah has been fighting this climate change issue but it's fascinating the nuance she has it's not just she doesn't just say you know we must reduce re and so on and 
which makes absolutely no sense. There's a, there's a, um, a, uh, a person named Bill Reed uh, out of the Univers University of British Columbia who talks about the concept of one earth. So people can have a normal person, or if you're living in balance with the world, you live in one earth of its resources, that's your balance. But then many of the, the developed world lives in using two to three earths, whereas many of the developing world lives on less than half. So you, it's no, it makes no sense to go to someone like Leah in Uganda and say, could you cut back? Well, that's not, it's, this is, we're not talking about them cutting back. We're talking about them being able to equitably use resources. Now, should they use it in a proper way? Should they use horrible chemicals? Should they be using disposable plastics? Absolutely not. But that doesn't mean, there, if the messaging, which is often driven by the Global North, which says reduce, reuse, recycle, blah, 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 blah. For the majority of the world, it's, it's not. It's all about equity. It's about training people. It's not about basically um, excavating African resources and pouring them into North America and Europe. So also just to say, too, that it's not just young people protesting. Um, and Ilya and uh, Chie do that very well. They're, they're very strong. They also do a lot of work on the ground. It's also young people for coming forward in crises and when, what happens in crises and so one of that has been the COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic, because er, in early March of last year, we do a lot of work with young people in the informal settlements in Nairobi. Um, there's a, one in, um, there's two major ones, Kabira and Mathari, um, which have over a million people living pretty, you know, living almost on top of one another in what would you would be considered if you went there, um, sewers. I mean, they, they live in the waste of the whole of the city. Um, but what happened was a lot of these young people came forward and said, listen, there's fear in our communities last March. There's fear. We don't know what to do. What can we do? So the big thing at that time was hand washing. So they said, listen, we can set up hand washing stations. We can do this cheaply. Let's do it. So they did. Um, and the, by the end of, by about August 12th, so which is International Youth Day last year, they had 94 stations running. They'd done two and a half million hand washes. And the communities they were in, the informal settlements they, they were in, had some of the lowest um, COVID rates in all of Kenya. And then we also moved to Somalia. We did stuff in Mogadishu. We did stuff in Kismayo. We also somehow picked up something in Ecuador as well. So nonetheless, these were really impressive groups and what they did. But what the climate change aspect of this is water. They cannot access water in informal settlements, pure water. Water is worth more than booze in terms of buying it, pretty much. It's run by cartels. Um, you, and so when you come to them and say, well, you should wash your hands. Now, we know washing your hands is not the be all end all that, that we once thought it was. I mean, washing your hands way down there between social distancing, which is also completely impossible in an informal settlement, which in one area is looking at over 1,500 people per square square kilometer. I mean, it's insane that the, the density or masks, which no one can afford. Um, but this issue of water came up and the issue, and so how we could get it in there, how we could move tankers in there, how we could get enough water so people could actually not just drink, but also wash their hands. I mean, and that's, I mean, the, the, the massive number of people who do not have access to to proper uh, sewage facilities who do not have access to potable water is huge um, in, within upwards of a billion people in the world. You know, and if you're from Canada and you, um, and it's, I think it's the same situation in the United States, but if you're from Canada, you know that the number of boil water advisories in Northern communities and indigenous people who live in the same conditions as or worse, than people who live in these informal settlements. Um, the boil water advisors have been there for 30 years. So we can pipe oil through their territories, but we can't pipe water. It seems it's pretty, again, inequitable. It's unjust and it's about climate justice. So what I was, my, my message is A, we have to look at it this way. We need to look at social justice equal and climate justice, but we also have to know that young people are moving forward and they are, they do have hope. And we have to be aware as well that what we call a double-edged sword, if you invest in young people, support young people, then the sword cuts one way and you can have amazing things that go really well. If you don't invest, you get the other side of the sword because they, they, young people also rise up. Young people also get angry, um, which is what I worry about with the, this Greta Thunberg um, people. I'm starting to see it more and more. 
again, you know, the young person who was nine years old from India, who's uh, just absolutely amazing. Her big conflict over the last while is because she supported the farmers in Delhi. And they had the head of the Greta Thunberg's movement, Fridays for Future, was thrown in jail. She was 15 years old on for sedition. So I think we really have to look at not radicalizing this generation and trying to build on their, their hope, build on where they want to go, because I think it has huge potential for change. But unfortunately, also has, also has huge potential for another side of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. So Doug has alluded to another important complex topic related to climate justice, which is the access to water uh, to, unfortunately, to too many people around the world is a luxury. And um, interesting enough, our next speaker, uh, Hanif Qureshi, um, who is a community artist and also connects art to uh, solar energy and electricity, it also, um, uh, his body of art also speaks to very much about the access to water and the intersection to climate justice. So without further ado, Hanif, uh, this is your <laughs> time to shine. Hi, thank you everyone for coming in for this important talk, topic of discussion. I think it's important that we all talk about it. Uh, uh, my name is Hanif. Uh, I'm an artist and I work with communities and uh, I'm also co-founder of Start India Foundation. It's a foundation which uh, works in public spaces and we, we create art for all in India uh, through art districts in major Indian cities. We work in uh, 10 different Indian cities uh, for the last five, six years and we continue to create innovative projects. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about three of the main projects which I find it relevant for this. This is a plastic ocean by Singaporean artist called Tan Si Zee. That's one. The second one is a question mark called Why by an Indian artist called Daku. And the third one also by, by Daku, which kind of like works with, uh, which talks about the water issue, but working with the solar uh, power. So starting with the, uh, Plastic Ocean, I just want to talk about like the process of like, you know, how this installation came up. Uh, she is, she is Tan Zizi, like the, the girl you see, she's from Singapore and she came in uh, to India for the part of this project in Mumbai, where we actually, the whole team uh, together made, was kind of made conscious to everyone collect plastic and whatever the plastic which we used, none of us kind of threw the plastic, we all saved all the, so the, this is the plastic which is consumed by 50, 60 people over a period of like period of month. And she collected all that plastic together and stitched them together to give it a feeling that what the fish or what the, uh, you know, uh, species would feel inside the ocean because that the whole, it gives you a feeling of like underwater and you are kind of like, you know, that choking with plastic. And that was the idea of this whole installation. And I think this was kind of like a, a good example of having uh, a community participating in it by and also making a group of people being conscious of like kind of plastic which they use. So that's so that's that's plastic ocean by Tan Uh moving on to the next by by Daku. Daku's again an Indian artist who's been who's made this installation by using plastic bottles with so this lake is in is in a city of hyderabad in south of india uh, this is this this lake is huge in the middle of a city but unfortunately the lake is equally polluted it does not have any kind of uh, life in it and it's it has like tons of plastic which has been floating on on it all the time even in this picture you can see that the kind of plastic which has been floating around so as a part of the project the artist collected all the plastics from the shore of the of this lake and formed it in the in the uh, as a question mark because when it comes to plastic there's there are always questions about it there's no really answer and this is like I'm kind of like showing you the process of like how this installation came into came into the picture but the point was about that whenever we, we are talking about plastic there's always uh, there's always questions we we do not have any any answers for that and that's quite unfortunate but as a role of the artist is to at least 
have this conversation within the society, let people be more aware about the subject and the topic. And this actually did reach a larger audience in, in India. And the whole, ex- the whole installation was solar powered as well. So that everything what you see, it doesn't take any electricity from the ground, but it's kind of like all these solar panels, which has been floating on top of it, kind of like highlights this issue at night as well. So that's uh, why by Daku. Uh, Moving on to another one, which is called the Day Zero. Uh, Again, by Daku, this is kind of, uh, this installation is actually made with shadows. So what you see is there is no paint or there's no projection on it, but the whole whole, uh, mural is kind of created with, with the shadows. And as the sun goes up, this mural comes to the comes to the light, and it's quite metaphoric to the to the idea of having having the sun going up and the water shortage is coming up because the city of Chennai in in June 2019 the city officials of Chennai declared day zero. Day zero is when the city ran out of water. When the when the government said that we do not have a water to provide to the people and. Day zero is not just in Chennai, but it happened in Cape Town as well. And it's been starting to happen in many more cities around the world, where even within India, in this next five years, according to uh, Niti Aayog, which is one of the Indian government uh, data lab, has predicted that there's going to be 10 cities, major cities in India, will also go out of water at one point. And this is a kind of like, important top topic to talk about because uh, city has been facing these water issues since the beginning of uh, you know since the city has been formed so these are like three relevant uh, projects which i thought would be useful to talk about uh, and yeah uh, we'll over to you thank you Michelle is serving for Mayor's Office of Atlanta, um, a Office of Resilience, and she's leading a myriad of projects. And the one that uh, she'll be covering today is very much about the reuse of the construction materials. But without further ado, I will leave uh, Michelle to introduce herself and uh, run us through the main uh, important points of the project. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, My name is Michelle Wiseman, and I'm with the City of Atlanta Mayor's Office of Resilience. And I really focus on uh, not only waste diversion, but now the term is circularity. So what is a circular economy as opposed to a linear linear economy that I think a lot of, um, especially Americans, have really bought into? So the thing that I'm really uh, focused on this year is the concept of the built environment. So when you look at the built environment, even if you look around the room that you're in now, I'm sure any room has um, either wood, cabinets, floors, doors. So we are actually looking at, instead of the traditional demolition where people come in and just tear a home down and take everything to a landfill, we actually need to look at first of all, uh, historic preservation. And I'm gonna give you a reason why historic preservation is so important. We're in Atlanta, Georgia, and just four hours south is the coast of Georgia. And the coast of Georgia is where the slaves would come in um, to Savannah, the port of Savannah. So uh, there were actually bricks that were handmade by slaves that were recovered from um, an excavation project as opposed to a demolition. So when you look at material like this, not only is it, um, it's material that has life in it, but it's also history. So that's very important. And um, for example, when the Southeast was being developed, there were these very specific um, pine trees, uh, long leaf pine trees that were very plentiful in the city and now they're actually in danger. So when we talk about uh, deconstruction, we can actually take that material um, for reuse and these, if they were uh, in a home, you could actually take up these wood floors, finish them and reinstall them in another uh, situation. The other thing about historic preservation is that uh, the city of Atlanta is going through gentrification right now. And gentrification, everyone has already been talking about how the people that have been 
historically underrepresented are the first ones that are being displaced. So if you take uh, usable material, you can actually um, increase the value of homes and have people stay in their homes as opposed to uh, homes being taken away for gentrification process. So the other thing about deconstruction is that it's really um, for art purposes, and that's one thing that we love about it, is that any home before it's demolished needs a walkthrough, a walkthrough through artists. If they can take, uh, maybe they can take a mantle and make something beautiful out of it. Maybe they can take a window pane and repurpose it. So we not only want that material for, um, for reuse, but for art, for um, weather, weatherization on other buildings. And it's estimated that for every one demolition job, there are seven deconstruction jobs. So you're looking at artists of all types from carpenters, plumbers, electricians. So this is a good way for them to learn their craft and it's uh, what we're doing in the city of Atlanta is really um, doing a training program to help the people, especially in this community, learn these skills. Weatherization to reduce the energy burden. Um, Atlanta has the fifth highest energy burden in the United States. And you, energy burden is basically how much of your income it takes to maintain your home. So because it gets so hot in Atlanta, if you had more efficient homes, we could actually reduce your energy burden. And that's part of what we're also doing with the deconstruction program. Uh, Atlanta is home to a lot of the movie studios and theaters. So once again, we have um, not only construction crews, but also um, artists that come to help us build sets. They can reuse the material. They can um, be creative in terms of what type of images are being portrayed on, on these um, movie sets. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about our food forest. Atlanta has is home to the largest food forest in the United States, 7.1 acres. It's right in the middle of a neighborhood. And we're really um, hypersensitive to the gentrification in the city of Atlanta. So we're working directly with the community to make sure that the um, that those neighborhoods, those uh, people in the communities are not displaced. So we go into the food forest, bring the community in um, on this lower uh, photograph. That's actually the compost bin that we created out of reused material. So we are not only growing food, we are growing compost. The community can actually come in and help themselves to all this fresh food. And it's just giving um, increased access. That's a whole nother conversation about the mayor's goal to increase access, food access to um, especially the most vulnerable communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was, uh, uh, thank you for sharing with us the circular economy perspective from Atlanta and how artists can also play a role in it. And definitely it takes a village to change the behavior of the entire ecosystem in order to meaningfully achieve the climate justice that we're talking about. Um, and next we have Jessica Anderson, the computational artist from the United States. So uh, you might uh, remember her from the Science Technology Innovation Forum uh, from two years ago at the United Nations, where she positioned at that time another artwork um, when it comes to, um, uh, well, actually the water relation to climate change and climate justice. And now uh, she's more speaking about the canopy and the connection to climate justice and climate change. So without further ado, Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roxanda. <clears throat> yep, I'm an artist and experienced designer here in Atlanta. Um, I run a small digital art studio called Into Out Of, and I'm also a research scientist at the Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, working on diversity in data. I'm gonna talk about a project that my partner and I created as part of the Digital Naturalism Conference. Um, this event is a gathering of field biologists, interaction designers, and technologists in different remote areas around the world. Um, and I just wanna take a second and highlight that conference because I think it's through collectives like this that we can make rapid progress where technology, art, and biological sciences converge. For this installation, 
Um, it's called palm reading. Um, we collected very local data. We attached electrodes to palm leaves at different locations around the island where this conference was held um, to measure the bioelectrical activity in the plants over time. And then we then built responsive computer graphics uh, to visualize the measurement data uh, in changes to color, shape, and motion. Uh, so the millivolts of electrical potential in these plants um, determine how the animation moves, what color it is, and how those color ch colors change. There's some links there in the slide. Um, you'll see if you press play on one of those videos um, that this, this visualization is um, an, uh, a slow moving animation um, that's uh, in three dimensional space. Um, and our, our intent was to make the active living energy of plant life visible, um, to show activity around us that we're typically just take for granted. Um, and when the visualization is running in real time, uh, you can see dramatic changes in the electrical activity when you touch a leaf or move palm fronds or break a twig. Um, and so we wanted to show the immediate effects that humans can have on plant life. Because I, th because I think a lot of the ways we imagine and talk about climate change is in larger time scales. Um, and I feel like that can minimize a sense of urgency. Um, so if a person sees that their interaction with the environment causes immediate changes, um, we think, I think, it reinforces the notion that humans have a consequential relationship with the environment. Um, so we think of this project kind of like relationship building with plants, um, which is why we call it a palm reading. Um, we're sort of seeing what we don't normally see, um, the way that they're behaving. In these videos, there's two different um, animations. You'll see that there are two different sizes. Um, and so both of these trees that we are both of, I'm sorry, both of those visualizations are from a single tree the smaller visualization is just lower down on the tree while the larger one is up high on the tree. Um, so we, we just put those side by side to get a sense of what was going on in one single plant. Um, and so, the, but these are trees that are in Thailand that are represented here. And so this is an installation that I'd like to activate in a number of locations to see sort of comparative um, plant portraits in a way. Um, or to activate many instances of the installation in one place to create sort of a um, local ecosystem portrait of a place. Um, but yeah, I hope you'll take a second and check out the video, see the link and see what we were up to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. That's very exciting, right? Uh, I like how you said the relationship between plants and human beings. <laughs> it, it's it's a bit sad that we have to actually build a relationship, you know, <laughs> we're so taken out of the natural habitat at this point. Yeah. Um, so definitely there are a lot of questions about that during the moderated conversation, but now we're turning to our last speaker for today. Uh, Regine Guevara, uh, who is a young uh, leader and also uh, one of the leaders of the Committee for Asian Youth Cooperation, among many other organizations. And she's also leading the SDGs villages um, in the Philippines. So um, I hope, Regine, your internet connection is good up there and you can join us off mute. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so great. <laughs> fairly good technology for the next few minutes. <laughs> oh, la la. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Roxana, for organizing this and for um, being very cooperative as we, we were planning this for two months already. We're very excited to be here and be in the presence of different regions around the world. So as Roxanda has mentioned, I represent the Committee for ASEAN Youth Cooperation to some global processes. And so as you know, um, ASEAN, we have 10 member states. And I'm gonna start maybe the discussion from a regional to um, local lens because a, a bulk of what we do is really 
um, a toss between the local and the regional. So we focus on empowering local actors, but scaling it in region in, into the regional level, which it's quite works for us because we have um, a lot of regional frameworks in place already. Oftentimes we skip um, some of the discussions at the national and then in the global. So it's really an interesting toss between local to regional. Um, uh, two of the things that we've been focusing on are like maybe half of um, the half first part of the theme and then the second part of the theme. So we focus on youth, peace, and security, and we focus on environment sustainability. But it, this webinar is quite a challenge for me because I have to like bring them together. And we often really don't, like in our organization, um, look at it in the broader context of climate justice, like putting it uh, SDG 30 and maybe, and then 16 together, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, so we focus um, a lot on youth, peace, and security. So we have e-learning modules, um, that I maybe mean, I'll just briefly touch on this because it's not exactly related to the topic, but in a sense, like we, um, this is how we traditionally use um, technology in our region. Um, there are a lot, there's been a, an increase in launch of different e-learning platforms. And then in, in the environment sustainability side, that's where SDG Villages comes in. So it's um, a movement to, it's a um, trying to tackle SDG 12 and 13 at the same time and maybe even seven. So from promoting electric vehicles, we just had a side event with you and Habitat on um, inclusive public transport to repurposing and reusing, recycling plastic and fabric waste. So then I guess like tying those two things together, climate justice, it's about um, pe balancing the people and the planet goals, right? So um, hopefully through this conversation, we're able to figure out how exactly we are to do that in our region. But just to say that for now, it's a bit um, separate, like those two conversations. Um, I'm calling in from Davao City, actually. I'm not. I'm not on my in my hometown right now. It's the largest city in the world by landmass. Coincidentally, um, I happen to be in the province right now. It's a bit too congested and um, actually uh, really difficult in in the capital right now because of the pandemic. ASEAN urbanization is a regional issue. So um, we're really heavy on empowering local actors. By 2025, the number of inhabitants in ASEAN is expected to double. And so two years ago, we launched the ASEAN Smart Cities Network. But the idea behind this SDG Villages is to kind of um, have a more grassroots approach to, to, to what is a very regional issue, like I said, um, of urbanization. So in the Philippines, we have this concept of barangay, which is loosely translated to village. It's the smallest um, unit of local governance with about, it could range from like 100 families to a few, a few thousand families where um, it's a unit of governance. So people elect their leaders and, it, and then a few barangays compose a smaller district, a larger district before we get into the cities. So the idea behind this regional movement, and we're only piloting it in the Philippines, is to further localize what is already local because there's also a danger of like um, the local being co-opted by a few, by a few, um, especially urban, highly urban or like smart city type of actors. So um, I'm just going to go over this very briefly because um, they're, it's not exactly related to the topic, but that's the idea behind um, working with SDG villages slash barangay. So in the Philippines in particular, our problem is um, we have a big plastic problem. We're about the third in the world um, when it comes to plastic pollution. So one of the solutions um, that was uh, that was proposed at the local level by our youth councils, which is which is also elected at the village level, is my base as sachet. So we have this culture of um, using like really really tiny plastic sachets for our shampoos, our our soaps, our toothpaste. You know, so like we consume in like very small. Um, 
in very small units, but on a mass daily basis. So hence, you know, the big plastic um, problem. And then um, it's basically the idea is to repurpose them. So we so there are um, partner engineers that have device technology to transform these plastic wastes into eco bricks to develop smart smart homes for the urban poor, and then um, and so on and so forth. It also includes it also includes um, urban gardening. So repurposing. Now we're at the point of engaging hospitals to repurpose alcohol containers and. Um, laundry detergent uh, plastic bottles because you know the hospitals are very congested now with um, the different COVID-19 patients so how do we repurpose all that um, additional plastic waste into um, into um, what is also a trend which is urban gardening so so um, so that's another project uh, related to plastic repurposing and then we try to like look at the different um, possibilities with SDGs. So we've mentioned um, housing and, and then there's food security and um, maybe livelihood projects. So there are also, of course, with working with local artists, looking at how do we re do the usual reusing and recycling so that um, they could create innovative products to be sold in the market. Thank you, Roxanda. Thank you so much, Regine. Yeah, thank you. Um, so with that, we have pretty much finalized the uh, Tech Talk style presentations from all the speakers. I would encourage our speakers to put on the camera. <laughs> It'll be easier to, <laughs> to observe your um, uh, expressions and uh, to engage during the conversation. So if you can turn your camera on, that'll be fantastic. Um, and uh, I think my first question to all of you, uh, we have heard two very dissimilar uh, perspectives, one of the interconnection of art, technology, and science, particularly for behavioral change, um, change of habits or awareness or educational purposes. And then we heard, we have heard from the public sector and multilaterals, um, or from Michelle, we have heard about uh, programming, like creating the, a new ecosystem for the construction industry, uh, that is a greener uh, source for jobs. It is also a greener um, uh, business and, and a more sustainable sort of supply chain. And then we have heard from Doug how in the global south, uh, um, the importance of the mobilization of the young people and, um, and uh, taking their voices into consideration to create changes in the way that uh, um, maybe some of the programming is being done, right? Uh, and some of the issues going to climate justice are being addressed. Um, we have all also heard from uh, Regine herself, who is a, a young leader in, in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, you see, in Philippines, not Philadelphia, uh, in Philippines, uh, that also um, is utilizing her leadership uh, and uh, is very much listening to the community to integrate uh, um, their issues uh, into the picture uh, of addressing climate justice. So I guess my question to all of you is if you see a way to interconnect um, art, data, science, technology into all the changes that you're doing in the programmatic uh, perspective, right? Uh, you have spoken about uh, installing uh, uh, water uh, installations, uh, and you have spoken about the construction industry, you have spoken about vertical gardens, food forests. Uh, do you see a better way to interconnect uh, the creatives into these interventions to create a holistic change? Who is a volunteer for to answer this question? <laughs> Michelle, go ahead. Uh, unmute so, yourself. <laughs> so so yeah. I did want to mention that um, on an international level, the winner of the Pritzker Award uh, went to a Paris-based company. And if you all do not know what the Pritzker Award is, it is uh, an international award. It's like the Nobel Peace Prize for architecture. And this year it was awarded to a Paris-based um, group that did an urban uh, renewal on a housing project. And they did it to make the housing more efficient. They did it to make sure that people were not displaced. They did it to make it more efficient for water and reuse. So they understand collectively how we can 
take all of these elements and to make a beautiful space because we all deserve a beautiful, efficient space. And that's why I'm glad that they were, you know, awarded on a national level to bring attention to all of these and, and put them all together. That's a wonderful answer, Michelle, because it definitely, from your perspective, is basically uh, how do we connect the utilitarian part with the, um, I guess, uh, more conceptual and the uh, behavioral part of the arts together to create this uh, a change from a production perspective. Any other answers to this question? I think um, <clears throat> just one thing, so it's Freya here, is um, yeah, for me, it's been really inspiring hearing about um, from all of the speakers, um, a lot of the projects which are, um, you know, which are making change at a local, um, whether that's, you know, at a local level or beyond. And I think um, <clears throat> what's interesting is the role as well that, um, Technology can play in the storytelling part of that to inspire. So um, I think there's so much, you know, often, um, and this is something with the first um, phase of the projects in Heartbeat to the Earth and something we're looking at going forward, is kind of that hopeful messaging for our own individual and behavioural change that we've heard about today can really in, can inspire change. And it's how those are um, communicated Sorry, I think, I don't know if my um, connection just went. Everybody froze, so apologies if you didn't hear. But um, <clears throat> I think it's that the, sol the solutions that are happening and um, how the role that technology and artists can help us engage with those more and hear about them because there's so much great work that is happening. On the COVID-19 side, I mean, we've seen um, some amazing work, especially around uh, graffiti artists, um, in informal settlements, again, they've been able to uh, really bring to life the challenges. And a lot of their work has been in The Guardian, The New York Times and such as kind of iconic of what's going on. So I think that kind of community art, um, whether it be graffiti, whether it be music, is a really great way of, A, it's, it's very low to the ground and it's not expensive, which is critical for a large percentage of the world. B, social media now is so pervasive that it's able to amplify people's voices um, and really bring out kind of their reality, which is, I think, what COVID has done. <clears throat> it's kind of a, we explain it as kind of a global experience. No, rarely do you, I mean, the only other times you hear about these are kind of like world wars and stuff like that. But you have this global experience where everyone is experiencing the same thing, maybe in shades of different ways. And this allows a dialogue to happen that I don't think has ever really happened in, a, in other areas. I mean, it rarely ever happens. So, and art seems to be the driver of that. Thanks. I mean, as a, I think as an artist, I think it's our role to kind of, uh, you know, uh, talk about the issues which is there in the society. And I think the, uh, the best way we can kind of do it is, is through, through the art, which is in, in mainly in public spaces. Uh, because we get this uh, opportunity to interact with an audience who's been out there, and uh, uh, it's having a having an art and technology supporting climate is is probably like the yeah. one of the best things to do at this at this time. Where like I mean, we, everyone's talking about it, but there's really no uh, action to it. And while art can also kind of like lead to that action and that change. Uh, even in India, I think there is like there are lots of these uh, small uh, projects which has been happening, which was maybe there, these projects were happening even before. But I think with the internet and with social media, it's now coming to uh, coming to the light. Everyone's got a platform to talk about, and I think that's that's great. Even right now, like how we are kind of like talking to each other from different parts of the world and talking about it. That's how I think even the uh, each individual artist has also their responsibility to talk about it. I wanted to jump in and say one more thing about the possibilities for technology and art. Um, one thing I think a whole lot about is the way that we can use technology to design novel experiences and new ways of knowing um, things that are very, um, I guess, common knowledge to us. We can make the world a bit I like to think about it as making the world a bit strange briefly in order to look at things and understand things maybe from a different framework or point of view. Um, and I think that when the, 
When we work with novel experiences, um, I feel like that our conceptual models of the world um, broaden like ever so slightly. And so it seems like it creates a bit of like motion and change in our mental framework. And those mental frameworks are how we um, judge and understand and behave in the world. Um, so I think that something that's, you know, is so much more subtle than say a call to action. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just reframing a bit in, in our minds. Um, and I think that that's, there's a potential there to, to shift like that state of motion, you know, to shift core beliefs in such a way that inform our behavior to change, um, maybe in healthier ways, maybe in, in ways that advocate for climate justice. But I think that sort of, there's, there's a space there that I think is, that has a lot of potential. I think in the past you were uh, uh, alluding to that as a physical engagement, right? Yes. A physical sort of experience. So fortunately, uh, as part of our generation, the ones that are coming up especially, we became more egocentric in that sense. And it's something that can be used into our advantage to help change behaviors. Exactly. Yeah. Think about how many, much we trust our experience and our own observation. You know, there's, there's potential. Definitely so. Um, so we have heard very different perspectives, right? We have heard uh, that art can be a way or a tool that can be integrated into actual the circular economy. Michelle has alluded to that perspective. Entire production um, can be changed and artists can play a role in that, more from a physical uh, engagement, uh, right, or production. Now we have also heard from Freya that how science, art, and technology can play more on the um, emotional perspective, the behavioral perspective. We have heard from Jessica also how it can play a role in uh, impacting uh, our physical uh, state of uh, mind and physical state of our body. And in a way, it can influence our perspective on how we see the world. We have heard also from Hanif um, about public space and how art can especially play a very important role uh, in the public space together with the community. And then we have heard also from Doug how the community is very important and where sometimes technology might not be as accessible as in other places and um, art should be reinvented in a different way, in a more accessible way. However, social media can be another vehicle, right? So these were the main uh, threats of thoughts here. And this can be a fantastic segue into a question primarily for our technologists here, Jessica, Free, and Hanif. You all have showed how technology plays a role in your art in the production, right? We have heard from Jessica how technology can intensify a feeling, a connection to um, a more uh, remorse uh, part of our environment, like a plant, like a tree. Um, and connect with, create this engagement. And then we have heard from Priya how science, technology, and art can be uh, merged to help us understand more, uh, for example, the, the, um, the issues around the ocean um, and uh, the ocean studies and translate some of this very academic data into something visual to make it more accessible, more educational. We have heard from Hanif how technology, more as in solar energy, uh, can intensify the message of, uh, of an art piece and um, can um, travel. He, he mentioned that his art uh, became so, well, the art of the, uh, the, of the artists that produced the, those installations became so known throughout India and uh, it made this topic surface uh, more in the upper side of our communication, right? So we have heard all these different perspectives and I'm uh, wondering if you um, uh, believe, the three of you believe that um, art technology and science is the way, this sort of hybridization is the way um, to perhaps create <laughs> more local to regional to global change, uh, especially in the way we see climate justice. And I'm also wondering how you achieved that perspective. Was it more of an accident or uh, it was a realization because of our context and our, uh, we were part of the, of course, the fork industrial revolution, technology becomes more and more important. 
uh, in our conversation. So I would love to hear your perspective. Uh, if, you, if you can kind of like uh, repeat the question uh, once again, please. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, well, there are two questions, really. I mean, one is how you came to this realization of con the connection between art, technology, and science, um, and if that was an accident or uh, um, it was something else that made you understand the importance of this hybrid connection between the three. And then lastly, if you think that uh, this connection between art, technology, and science can enable the art itself become more impactful and travel from a local to regional to global perspective and, uh, and change not only our own community here, but the entire community of this planet. For me, it, it isn't like accidental, but I have been kind of like, you know, uh, working with, with art and technology uh, for some time, but obviously my, our definition of technology and science can always be very different and we can always have like you know a different at least in this part of the world where like the artist which i'm talking about working with is is actually working with the sun right and and the and the movement of the sun and the, and the how uh, the sun path works which is in not a technology but nature I mean, nature is also a complex technology, kind of like, you know, which we live in, like there is some kind of like system which works behind. So it's also like working with nature. I believe that's also like some of the working with nature's technology, like work, if you're talking about solar power as, as, as one of the things. Uh, on the other hand, like, do I believe that, like, yeah, these two things are like crucial? Yeah, definitely. I think it is like for the time which we are in, it is, it is important that uh, yeah, that's the only way we're going to like get the message out. Uh, it is also the way to like let people let more people participate in in the art. It's also the way to like take the feedback, receive the feedback. They can like there can be like many more works which at least the technology allows an opinion, also allows that participation and understanding as well. While it's just not just art for the aesthetics itself, but I think art which is somewhat functional. Uh, and I think we need like more art which is not just from this aesthetic sense but like having more functional value to it also art is a bridge art is a bridge between old young rich poor anyone can be creative any language it you know it's one of those things that um it's a part of our soul so it's really helpful and, and we can provide a lot of um education information and um, connections through art. It's a bridge. Yeah. It breaks the barrier with, with whether you speak the language, you don't speak the language, whether you like, you know, or what part you are in, but it's always going to like, it's always going to have some kind of impact, right? Subconscious impact as well. Like something which you've seen years ago will also like come back as, as visuals in your head. And I think that's, that's pretty powerful. Um, like, and I think just when you're asking about this, um, you know, this relationship between art, technology and science. I think the relationship between art and technology is, isn't new. It's been there since the beginning of time. Like artists have always used the tools that are available to them. And it's just that this toolkit is expanding. Mm -hmm. And I think as it expands and we look at, um, and in, in one sense, it can open up access in terms of when you look at um, platforms that people can engage with, and the different tools, where as we spend more of our lives online, then we should be, you know, when we're looking at, um, you know, climate justice and, and all different types of um, topics um, that society faces, is that, um, that technology is a way and artists, it, it is a tool for artists to use to communicate what they want to um, communicate as well. And I think it will, it is just ever evolving. So I don't think it's accidental, but I also don't think it's new at all. And it's something that's been going on forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, for Chit, uh, the connection between art and technology is not foreign. I mean, that's uh, how a lot of the amazing art has been invented for about the year is because of disruption of technology. And I think now with the rising of frontier technology, that's, I think, where um, there is a, a lot of opportunity, but also... Uh, misunderstanding sometime <laughs> when it comes to the new technologies. And I see Jessica is also getting ready. Uh, no. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say um, that 
specifically um, the uses of technology for art right now, especially um, the way or the possibilities for using art in terms of data visualization, um, I think are just tremendous in terms of communicating scientific information that's that can be alienating to many people or difficult to understand or for any other reason, inaccessible information. I think there's a huge potential for this, where we're at, I guess, with art and technology to really um, be, a, be a bridge. Yeah, be a bridge. I also, I also think so. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, also, uh, <laughs> go ahead, dog, and then free up. Yep. I also think just having dealt with technology um, in Kenya and Global South and such, that we have to really be careful of overselling it. Um, also, we have to be careful that it's not necessarily the greatest thing for artists. Um, it can, I mean, we see it all over the place where artists, yes, they have a bigger palette, they have a bigger venue, in I'm talking in terms of commercialization of it, but then they get all their art gets stolen and people can't make any money. And I mean, so you have to, I always worry sometimes we get into a group think that, you know, oh, the best, you know, like AI and this kind of stuff. And isn't it great? Well, AI has a, is a small part of the accessibility to most of the world. Um, most people don't understand what a Bitcoin is or a blockchain or whatever. And actually what's happened now we see is that perhaps technology, specifically social media, has got so far ahead of it that we haven't, we have no idea of the ethics anymore. The ethics are like beyond us of our even understanding. And I think it's actually the, the role of art to find out what these ethics are, because it's kind of insane what's going on right now. Our world has so rapidly changed. We no longer know up and down. People can now take what is a blatant lie and manipulate it into truth. You know, just by finding the 15 people out of a billion that agree and then this them this saying it 50,000 times that it seems to be there. So, um, I, I mean, so I, I agree. I see the potential of technology, especially for artists here is great um, because it expands their ability to engage people. It also is a monetization, but it also has a dark side to it. And I think we have to make sure that we don't. Uh, no, Doug, you're actually sticking okay. to a very yeah. important topic. I think that's a reason why in 2020, the Secretary General put together the digital uh, cooperation, uh, I guess, framework, right? Um, because definitely technology is an opportunity to uh, raise even more avenues for human rights, but at the same time, unfortunately, can also become the obstacle for it, right? So I, I, like any new innovation, uh, it takes a time to uh, adjust and create uh, and, and find a way that uh, it's equitable at the same time it is um, a helpful, it's helping its, uh, um, its, its, um, its actual uh, purpose from the very beginning. So I don't know, Freya, if you want to <laughs> add more to that. Yeah, I was going to touch on something else, but um, just, uh, just, I mean, I could have a long conversation about it, but just very um, briefly, I think um, <clears throat> it's also just not tech for tech's sake as well. Like, I think the starting point, um, rarely may, you can, uh, I can argue this as well, but rarely is the starting point for an artistic, um, you know, for an artist, the technology, mm -hmm. um, unless it's purely they're looking at kind of experimentation, but it's about kind of what you want to um, say and what you want to communicate and then the best tools for that. Um, I know that doesn't respond fully, but I feel like that would I'd take up too much time. Um, but I just, because I, I just noticed earlier that in the chat, um, I think it was... Um, some someone had made um, Jimin. Sorry, um, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name um, correctly there. And apologies if um, not. Um, <coughs> you asked a question really early on about um, it's, it's concerns about um, kind of data storytelling mm. and around. Um, but you know, what if they? I have a question after data. Priya, if if that's helpful. Yeah, he, he was mentioning what can be done for the accessibility for effective use of data storytelling, especially as not all the companies are always sharing um, their data around climate crisis. Yeah, and and um, anyway, I just wanted to I just wanted to acknowledge it and just say that it's a really important question, and um, you can only work with if when you're purely looking at data, 
um, like ours, a starting point um, with um, working with the artists on Heartbeat of the Earth was purely the scientific data that was available. Um, but there are gaps and you have to, in any of that data storytelling, so how do you get a full picture? Mm -hmm. And I think it is a really big challenge um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of what is being communicated and how, and how something's being communicated and access to data. Mm -hmm. And access to data skills, too, because I was going to say that there's so many um, citizen data type routes into working with data and collecting data and making it available. Um, but and that seems like it's very accessible if we're doing like grassroots citizen data type projects. Um, but then the barrier is data skills. And I think that's the reason why there are so many frameworks in place, right? Uh, the, I know, Priya, you mentioned you work with UNFCC um, in that regard, so, so that's, that's how uh, you can uh, validate even more the, the data and have it, uh, and it which usually it's, it's basically a nexus of different resources. So I think having multi, multiple partners could be helpful in that regard. And um, I know uh, uh, I'm also curious if we can now create a segue into our uh, governments and the multilateral speakers, especially. Um, I know that both uh, Michelle, Doug, Regine, you all have alluded to uh, the importance of community engagement, right? So uh, Michelle has uh, emphasized uh, how COVID-19 helped uh, move the needle on two fronts, uh, the access to healthy food, but also the access to historic pre uh, preservation and uh, the creating of a new construction ecosystem. Uh, Doug has um, uh, emphasized uh, how the young people, um, in a way, created this um, uh, community um, and, and um, uh, to address the water sanitation in Somalia, in Kenya, in Nairobi, uh, and uh, in Ecuador. And we have also heard from Regine how uh, youth themselves organized to create more, more resilient communities and come up with uh, new perspectives uh, of, of um, mentorship and social entrepreneurship uh, by creating vertical gardens and so on. So uh, I'm curious uh, if you have a plan on how to sustain this community engagement for climate justice, even post-pandemic? The thing about not only art, but all of the conversations we're having is that they're so interconnected. So um, I think it's up to us to uh, not only connect them, but to be able to sustain them, but that's through engagement and education. So it's, I, I just think that it's a layered approach and we just have to, you know, understand what the end game is, sustainability, of course. But until people understand and realize the value, it's it, it, to me, it's that that's that's the critical part. So, Roxana, I just wanted to quickly bring in um, the policy lens into the discussion because earlier in one of the side events <laughs> that I've been to today, I'm, I'm quite Tired, but this is a really um, interesting and engaging discussion. So I'm going to try to uh, synthesize what I learned today in connection to the topic. So um, side event on um, youth and governance with UNDP. So they are the co-lead for Youth and Politics Task Force in GCYPS. So we had a panel of young politicians, young public servants, basically young people who are in decision-making spaces. And I think they do play a role in this discussion, in every discussion on SDGs. Of course, we have to empower um, our local actors, especially those left behind. But to break the silos in our generation, we have to to continue to bridge the conversation between those who are on the ground and those who are on decision making spaces we, among our among the young people. So um, I guess the question that we have to throw to young politicians and public servants is how can they engage the creative community and then um, ensure that their their 
projects are scalable and that's where tech and art comes in. And I think I can give a few examples. Um, so in the Philippines, as I mentioned, we have uh, the concept of barangay, which is the smallest unit of local governance. And we elect our youth council at the local level. So a few hundred families in a barangay, the young people from 16 above will elect their youth leaders every six years. And um, I think this is a good way to ensure that the youth leaders at a young age will, will exercise accountability from passing small resolutions at the local level, micro resolutions at the local level on zero waste, you know, tackling the root of the problem, like how do you reduce waste in, um, in your own village or in your own community to um, mobilizing funds because it's part of the wider governance system the local youth council receives funds from the Senate and the Congress. And maybe it's about reappropriating these funds to um, support artists and scientists and, and ensure that, um, that there is a co-creation environment um, within the youth councils and then their youth constituencies. Uh, it could be as simple as art murals. And I know that we've seen so many art murals and whenever we talk about art, um, we, we begin with art murals, but it's actually a very important space for um, self-expression and co-creation, especially for those who are not often given seats at the table. And because this can be an inspiration to, to bigger projects, like for, for instance, um, consultations, not just art murals, but consultations in general have resulted to the social enterprises that I mentioned a while ago, the repurposed vertical gardening um, uh, vertical gardening tanks um, that address the wider problem of food security. So there, I guess that's my main contribution, the aspect of youth in policymaking. Thank you, Regine. Yeah, and thank you for bringing the conversation again back to sustainable development goals. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, both you and Hanif are speaking quite a bit about the community engagement, right? Um, community engagement as in the residents in the space and uh, the public space, access to public space, uh, right to the city, right? That sort of a narrative. Um, so that's uh, definitely noted. I don't know if, Doug, you want to share anything when it else related to community engagement especially from the prism of the uh, geographical representation, um, both in Kenya and Somalia and Ecuador. You have worked during this year in all of those spaces. Um, you have worked very closely with the communities. Um, so what, what is there in store uh, that can sustain this community engagement even post-COVID, right? With COVID, now we saw a lot of community engagement, which is fascinating, obviously. <clears throat> well, I think, um, fortunately or unfortunately, it's as sexy or not as governance. I mean, governance is what keeps people engaged. So what you were discussing, I think it was Eugene, sorry, I wasn't on there. But <clears throat> about, you know, creating local governance. How does governance happen? How are young people involved? They can create and you can create the conditions for them to create, whether it be art, whether it be trying to impact change. But really, if you don't have your governance down, if you're not able to um, meaningfully engage people, then uh, that's where things fall apart. And I would say the world we're in right now, um, even with COVID in which people seem to have a little bit more faith that government may be able to do something, hopefully, and be able to solve, put us, pull us through this, this pandemic. Pre, before that, I mean, I would say young people by the vast majority were completely disillusioned. They did not believe that anything represented, there was no representation, real representation in government for them. Um, the climate movement, I think, is a perfect example. And you heard that from all, all the people that spoke, um, or sorry, of the meeting. But I mean, a lot of the women, young women that I was mentoring, mentioning and were on that uh, slides that I was mentioning, they all have are hypercritical of their government. They really are. And so I think that we can, I think that art and I think that technology both provide great vehicles and, and great ways to engage people, but we need to go further in finding other mechanisms that are sustainable. And that's where I think our, the challenge of the, this coming many years is going to be, is trying to figure that out. 
There are several topics, I think, things that came out from your uh, remarks is more the governance, both governments from a uh, community engagement perspective, but also governance uh, from a uh, top-down perspective and governance of data. <laughs> so it seems like that's uh, the, the trend of the <laughs> of each talk today. It's the governance piece. Um, how, what kind of frameworks are we creating in order to ensure this trust? Um, and then, of course, utilize art as a way to integrate or create bridges or um, create, create a, um, a connection between the utilitarian and uh, the more conceptual world and uh, the behavioral change. I mean, there are a lot of questions that I have here in terms of the projects per se. Of course, if we speak, if we move away now from the technology and behavioral change and the community engagement specific to uh, your topic. So Doug, you have spoken more about the access to water. Hanif, you also spoke about the access to water, right? Um, of course, from different lenses, but very similar. And of course, this is not an accident. Um, so I'm curious um, if uh, what you've learned during these past years, especially including uh, this 2020 year, um, if there is something that you're trying to integrate in the projects to come uh, in, in 2021 and the, in the years to come. COVID has definitely like kind of, you know, at no point changed the stance on 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 the climate justice, you know, at least from on on our side, where of course a lot of things have like you know uh, changed and and the world is like kind of seen to be a different world uh, uh, while since the pandemic has begun. But our, our focus on on these topic has not has not changed, and we continue to work in these uh, in this field. I wish art can create like water you know or i like it, it create it can actually solve some problems rather than kind of talking about it i mean we can always talk about it but I, if there's a way in which some solution can be can be bought if there is if there's a project which actually does like uh, some kind of actual justice on ground that would be that would be much more meaningful i mean I'm, i i look forward to having some projects which actually helps and creates some real change on ground as well. This is a wonderful idea, actually. Why not art to, to become the magical tool for our from our fairy tales that can transform something into water? Yeah, yeah why not? The technologies, yeah, why not? I'm sure, it can can enable you some some of those ideas through, through Everything is possible, right? Everything's possible. Maybe Google but, can help us. Maybe Google Art Culture, Google Arts <laughs> can definitely help us with that. I mean, they, they've got like all the information of the world, right? Yeah, what, what, why not transforming the information what? into water itself? That's why. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <about it? laughs> yeah, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think we have been in conversation, so with, um, yeah, the street, with your organization previously. So, yeah, yeah, we have, we have worked with like, actually, I have, uh, Worked with uh, Google Arts and Culture uh, for a, for a, for a project, and we do have a presence on on Google Arts and Culture as yeah. well. And we work with uh, India Chapter on a regular basis. Yep, we're always but, open to collaboration. Yep. Back to the question of Hanif, you have um, you have briefly spoken about the community engagement when it comes to uh, the plastic ocean installation. Um, yeah. But I think it would be very important to the panel to uh, know how this plastic has been um, collected, right? Because you have worked with a particular part of the community that is not necessarily, um, unfortunately, part of the narrative or the in community engagement, uh, the, the typical community engagement per se. So maybe you can develop that idea further. Yeah, I mean, like uh, India has. I mean, this we still like we are in 2021, but there's still a caste system which has been like which is being followed, and there are rack pickers or certain like belongs to uh, uh, you know, one community which is kind of like kind of like you know and back in the days they were kind of like called untouchables where like people never used to like touch them and uh, so that even like continues to happen today where obviously they're not called untouchables or whatever but there's, there's a section of society which has been focusing on the on the garbage and it's been interesting that like how 
uh, even the recycling or whatever has been happening so far, uh, I have personally kind of like visited uh, uh, two biggest plastic manufacturers in the world, like one in, in Thailand and like one in India. Uh, and they have actually, uh, uh, they have these huge plants which converts these collected plastics into, into fabric, into a fiber. So there are like these, there are these plants in this, and I, I see that more and more of this technology is being used. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, even though when you see these plastics have been recycled, but maybe only 5% of plastic may be recycled, whereas 95% of plastic is, is not like, half of the plastic is not recyclable. And, and that's the situation we are in. And also like you're talking about this whole plastic and this idea of like blaming the public for plastic as well. While I believe it's the Coca-Cola who should be responsible for the plastic and not us. You know, when you guys are from Atlanta, so maybe you can guys can give a message to Coca-Cola as well that <laughs> that you know that they are like if we just remove these two like big giant manufacturers of the plastic, the half of the world plastic will be solved. But you know, like we are kind of you know we are whatever the efforts we are making are these tiny efforts against this like giant corporation. We're just like small little ants in, in this whole system. But even for us, it is important to like, you know, to continue to, to talk and uh, yeah, fight and uh, at least have, make people aware about it. So coming back to this community uh, question, for the, for, the, for the question mark, the, the, we spoke to all the people around the lake who've been like collecting plastic, you will see that there are like young boys who kind of like starts their day in the morning with this like huge, like, you know, uh, bag of plastic. And they kind of, all they do is just walk around the, walk around the lake and look for like plastic. And not only the lake, but the litter, the problem of litter, people been, people throwing garbage everywhere. It's, it's kind of pretty, like it is a, a topic in India as well. And these guys are, kind of, it's not an organized sector. It's pretty unorganized, this whole situation, how, how this happens. Yet, it, it's, it works. It's, there is still like, you know, India probably recycles a lot many things. I mean, the recycling is also part of our culture. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, we use paper, we use plastic, we use, we, we do multiple uses. We don't do like single use, you know, things. Um, many of these things are like naturally, uh, at least reusable. So that at least it has a longer life. Thank you, Hanif. Um, and you have spoken quite a bit about the community engagement, and then we have heard how even the social groups that are vulnerable can play a role in the production of the art and being acknowledged into the process. And um, this question is primarily for Freya. I know that she has a toddler to take care of. So um, a last question for her. It's, uh, you know, when we speak about community engagement in the nonprofit and uh, the multilateral and the civil society world, we always uh, more are alluding to the communities as in the people, the citizens, the, um, the people that are just living in those areas rather than necessarily a community of artists or a community of scientists. You have, however, developed a very interesting perspective in working with scientists, right, alongside artists, alongside technology. So maybe you can elaborate more on that and how you work with scientists and also with multilaterals like UNFCC, for example, if that have changed something in your process uh, of working with art technology. Um, hi, Alexander, thank you. Um, so, I mean, we've always, <clears throat> We think, yeah, I, I guess um, a lot of kind of the work that I do is um, artist led uh, in terms of what's created. But then within that and particularly around the data storytelling um, works that we've been doing was the importance of kind of scientific um, validation. Um, and um, so therefore, um, the scientist, you know, was a really integral um, part of that um, collaboration. And um, how that was facilitated depended on um, the, the the topic and um, the sometimes it was, you know, through the artist or through um, other partners that we were able to kind of facilitate those connections. 
but I yeah very much see myself and apologies if you can hear a lot of screaming in the background um I um yeah see myself kind of as a um facilitator and it really is about bringing together um people from um different fields and um facil- facilitating those um collaborations and I then let the brilliant people do the work and I just look at where those connections um can be made and similarly with the UNF Triple C you know we're really delighted to um work with them to announce the heartbeat of the earth um program um last year and I think again um it was looking at new ways of engaging um, people online with climate data. Wonderful. Um, and yeah, so, so we have heard quite a lot about what community engagement means for every single speaker, I would, I would say. Um, and I see in the chat, I'm having a reminder that very, we have an intervention from Major Group for Children and Youth. So um, if the representative can uh, share their question, that would be fantastic. Um, so um, I am curious if Doug, Regine, uh, Jessica, uh, Freya, Hanif, if you want to do any um, uh, last remarks uh, until we uh, wrap up our conversation for today. I, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I've got to go because strangely enough, I have another event I'm presenting at at 9 p.m. tonight. Um, so uh, I just wanted to thank you. I think it was really interesting. Um, it'd be great if there's anything written up from this event. I don't know, or something produced, or video, or whatever. Yes. Um, we'd love to, to share some of the findings. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. It's been great. Wonderful. No, Doug. And uh, yes, definitely this is being recorded, and it will be shared with everybody. And uh, we will. Uh, definitely worked out some uh, articles. So we'd love to collaborate with all of you <laughs> to make sure that right. our words are speaking the truth. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> so thank you, Doug. Thank you for your yeah. attention. And thank you for thank the collaboration. You. Yeah. Thank you, Priya. Thank you for the entire panel. Uh, I know that uh, this means many time zones and uh, it's very late in India, very late in Kenya. It's also quite late in Europe now. So, uh, so thank you again for finding the time to join us and to be part of such, a, of such an important conversation. This doesn't stay here. It will definitely be translated in some articles and also I will share the recording with everybody. This will be posted on the UN ECOSOC Youth Forum platform. And uh, also um, hopefully new collaborations will emerge from here. So thank you everybody. Thank you. And so while everyone is leaving, I would like to say you can find Atlanta Contemporary's YouTube channel where we post all of our event details and I will be sending a follow up with all of the information and notes regarding this particular panel. Roxana and I will connect and then work on that article. Uh, again, thank you for sharing your evening, morning, afternoon with us. <laughs> and we look forward to speaking with you all. <laughs> yeah. it's 11.30. Oh, wow. Okay, good night. (laughs) Good night, honey. Thank you. (laughs)